Welcome ladies and gentlemen. This is Karen Sharp with another session in our series of discussions on the study of racialism with Professor Randolph Hemmings. Good afternoon Professor, I am sure that the viewers are looking forward to today's topic. Thank you Karen. I'm glad to be here. Today's topic is the heredity of racial traits. Several years ago I asked a state park historian why African Americans never assimilated. Every group that came to America in the 19th century was initially seen as a non-white race. But after a few generations, their descendants intermarried. Germans, Irish, Italians, and Jews were no longer seen as non-white. Instead, each became accepted as just another white ethnicity. And I wondered out loud why this had not happened to African Americans. Why they continued to be seen as a distinct race. Because they look different, the historian said. And I thought to myself that Irish, Italians, and certainly people from India look different, but this did not stop them. I then noticed four children playing in the park grass. They were siblings, the children of friends. Both of their parents are of mixed ancestry. Each parent in turn has one white parent and one black parent, but they identify as members of the African American community. The two older children are quite dark, taking after their black grandparents. The two younger look completely European. The perennial family joke is that the older two children used up all of the family melanin, leaving none for their younger siblings. And so I thought to myself, it is simply not true that everyone born into the African American community looks different. Some people assume that the physical traits associated with the US color line blend in some non-Mendelian way. They assume that children cannot come out looking more European than both parents, nor more African than both. They assume that endogamous populations become ever more homogeneously blended over generations. All three assumptions are mistaken. This photo is of a friend, Charles E. Bird and his mum. Charles was one of the leaders of the political movement of the 1990s to add a multiracial checkbox to the US Census. He was also the publisher of Interracial Voice magazine and has published two books on multiracialism. It is true that the child of a Nordic-looking parent and a Nigerian-looking spouse will be of in-between appearance. But a child of two such in-between-looking individuals can appear anywhere along the range, from one extreme to the other. Parents of mixed intermediate Afro-European genetic admixture often produce white-looking or black-looking children. This is the later thicket, her daughter, and her granddaughter. One-fourth, one-half, one-fourth. A child of mixed parents has a 50-50 chance of showing color line related features midway between those of the parents, a one in four chance that it will look more European than either parent, and a one-fourth chance that it will look more African. This is Boris Becker's wife and child. But precisely what do we mean when we say that someone looks black? The very same individual may be considered white in Puerto Rico, colored in Jamaica, and Negro in Georgia. Forensic anthropologists today give more importance to prognathism than to other traits, and 19th century Americans emphasized foot shape. So today's topic looks at a single feature, skin tone. Nevertheless, keep three things in mind. First, many societies, Hindu India for example, do not associate skin tone with an endogamous barrier. We focus on skin tone because it is important to most Americans, hence the term color line and the group labels black and white, corresponding to brown versus pinkish beige skin tone. Second, skin tone is mechanically complex. Some people are darker than others before tanning, some tan more easily, some tan more deeply, and some tans last longer than others. Despite its complexity, dermal melanization depends on just a few genes. Finally, the following applies to any feature that depends on a handful of codominant additive genes, such as hair curliness, nose width, lip thickness, prognathism, steatopigia, and the like. 
it applies to all of the physical traits that Americans see as looking white or looking black. Not just skin tone. By the way, the young man on the right is James Earl Jones's son. Alleles do not blend. They are digitally encoded, not analog. The human genome contains about 750 megabytes of data. Because they are digitally encoded, alleles combine in simple, mathematically predictable ways. Imagine that skin tone depended on just one gene with two possible values, rather than the actual 3 to 6 genes. Someone with two black copies would look Nigerian. Two white would look Norwegian. And black white, or white black, would look Arabic or Puerto Rican. Now imagine that a black white father and a black white mother have a child. What are the chances that the child will have two black alleles, two white, or one of each? Work it out. It is the same as flipping two pennies and getting two heads, one of each, or two tails. One fourth, one half, one fourth. The photo shows twin girls. One is lighter than both parents and the other is darker. The chances of such siblings happening to any mixed couple are one fourth times one fourth, or one in sixteen. Incredibly, hundreds of genetically illiterate newspapers reported this photo as a one in a million chance. As every Dominican and Brazilian family well knows, it happens all the time. One fourth, one half, one fourth. It makes no difference how many additive genes affect skin tone. There are at least three, and probably no more than six. But the number of genes affects only the smoothness of the probability distribution. The upper left chart shows what the chances would be with just one gene. Upper right shows two genes. And lower left and right show the distributions for three and four genes respectively. The probability does not depend on number of genes, nor even on the species of organism. It applies to all sexual reproduction with digital encoding. One fourth, one half, one fourth. Now consider entire populations. Mere random probabilities for individual families become predictable distributions when you look at entire populations. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Spanish censuses of Puerto Rico reported that half of the population was white and half black. I think that they meant half Spanish and half African. Today, the native born island population physically matches the theoretical poison distribution almost precisely. About one Puerto Rican in ten looks white to most Americans, about one in ten looks black, and the rest look in between. The island's skin tone histogram has a single peak at the 50-50 mark, with population fractions diminishing towards both extremes. Now let's consider the question, how many white-looking children are born into black families? It varies by region. On average, people with 12% or less African admixture look white to most Americans. And those with up to 25% look mixed. That is, Hispanic or Mediterranean. Assuming that skin tone is set by four codominant additive genes, 3 to 6 in actuality, anyone with six or more European haplotypes out of the eight looks white. Consider Philadelphia. The mean European admixture in Philadelphia's African American community is about 20%. As shown by the two leftmost bars on the chart, this predicts about one white looking child out of every 500. That is the result of computing 0.2 to the sixth, because six out of the eight genes must align in order to produce European appearance, times 28 permutations, because that is how many different ways it could happen. Of course, counting how many children are born with European appearance measures opportunity, not action. There is no reason to think that all, or even most such Americans actually cross the color line and redesignate themselves white as adults. On the other hand, the mean European admixture among the Gichigala community of the American Sea Islands of South Carolina and Georgia is only about 3%. As shown by the two leftmost bars, the result is nil. It is computed as 0.03 to the 6th times 28 permutations. It simply cannot happen in the absence of outmarriage.
Now the opposite. How many black looking children are born into white American families? As with African Americans, it varies by region. Following the same assumptions, anyone with three or more African haplotypes out of the eight would look black. The mean African admixture among white Americans is about 0.7%. As shown in the chart, the result is nil. It cannot happen in the absence of intermarriage. It is computed as 0.007 cubed times 56 permutations. On the other hand, the mean African admixture among Argentinians and southwestern Iberians is about 5%. As shown on the chart, this predicts about one black looking child out of every 200. This is computed as 0.05 cubed times 56 permutations. Well Karen? That is my presentation for today. Thanks for listening. Thank you Professor. Very interesting as always. I must admit that I had a very hard time not laughing out loud when you told about the four siblings where the two oldest had used up all the family melanin. I thought you were talking about my nephews and nieces. My sister's children are like that except reversed. The two eldest are light and the little ones are dark. Yes. I imagine that many people saw themselves in that anecdote. Did we receive many viewer questions? Actually, our switchboard was swamped, but not with questions. Many people called just wanting to share stories of their own families, where siblings differ dramatically in appearance. Apparently, heredity is like rolling dice. Excellent analogy Karen. Heredity is indeed like rolling dice. If both parents have diverse ancestry, you never know what is going to pop out, so to speak. A gentleman from Baltimore quoted Malcolm X in 1963 as saying, quote, It's just like when you've got some coffee that's too black, which means it's too strong. What do you do? You integrate it with cream, you make it weak. But if you pour too much cream in it, you won't even know you ever had coffee. It used to be hot, it becomes cool. It used to be strong, it becomes weak. It used to wake you up, now it puts you to sleep." End quote. Well Karen. Whatever his political skills, Malcolm X was naive as to genetics. For humans versus coffee, if you mix together two cups of creamed coffee, the offspring can be pure coffee, pure cream, or anything in between. That is probably the most important lesson to take from today's topic. Children of multiracial parents can come out lighter than both parents, darker than both parents, or anywhere in between. The second most important lesson today is the probabilities themselves, one-fourth, one-half, one-fourth. Our last question is from a Londoner of West Indian ancestry. Why do you bother to study this? You seem to be obsessed with race. Would it not be better to just leave it alone? I understand the person's concern. It shows an important difference between British and Americans. West Indian or African immigrant outmarriage into the white mainstream runs about 38% in the UK, but it is one tenth of that in America. Consequently, the British tend to be more comfortable with the topic. And many are already familiar with much of what we talked about because they have friends or relatives with children of mixed ancestry. So, to them, the topic seems overblown and pointless. But most American viewers are uncomfortable with open discussion of a taboo subject. Consequently, many are ignorant of heredity. I have heard Americans affirm, in all seriousness, that a white woman can give birth to a black baby, if her husband is black for example. But that it is a genetic impossibility for a black woman to give birth to a white baby. They are shocked to learn the facts. And so, to answer the question, this topic is more useful in America than in the UK. Thank you professor. Well folks. That's all the time we have today. Next week, Professor Randolph Hemmings will discuss Melongeons, Red Bones, and other US Maroons, the three racial communities of the American South. This is Karen Sharp, signing off.